Hello everyone, it's Meredith from Sweet Slumber and I'm here to talk to you about some topics that I brought up in a weekly email that I sent out. So um, I like to make those emails really, really short. And by the way, if you want to subscribe, you can find out how on my homepage and also on my community page at sweetslumbertime.com. So please feel free to join my email um, list so that I can send you ideas and topics and videos every week, okay? So um, just a little bit of an outline. This video is about what to do in the nighttime if your child wakes up crying, whether it's a baby, a toddler, or a little child. Um, I usually work with clients up to about preschool or four years old. So um, I'm gonna talk about that, this whole video. And we're going to talk about different um, parameters for crying when it comes to like the leaps and the sickness and um, mental leaps and what else? Teething. So we need to know how to handle those times because you guys are really worried about bad sleep habits and spoiling your child and just doing things wrong because everyone always is telling you this is what you need to do but everyone has different opinions, right? So it's really confusing. So we're going to talk about the different scenarios that I brought up in the email and at the end I am going to talk about my services, okay? So hang with me. I'm going to try and teach you as much as I can in a short amount of time. My clients get this sort of help all the time on every topic and I really try to elaborate and expand on these topics. So this is just a taste of what you get when you work with me. So in the nighttime when a child cries, sometimes that is a new behavior and parents are definitely worried in those cases because uh, my kid doesn't cry during the night. Oh my gosh, what's happening? And then the other one would be just, um, this is an ongoing thing. It's going on forever and I want to solve it. I want to take care of it. There's so many different things that need to be done. If somebody makes a, a post in my successful sleep group that's like, um, this is what's going on. What do I do? I have so many questions for you and there are so many different things to explore. A lot of times the suggestions will just be something um, like a starting point or I let other people answer because they're probably gonna bring up a lot of other ideas and I'll just address one thing. So, crying in the night often has to do with a child not feeling secure in their crib, um, not falling asleep in the crib or the vestment because you held your child and then transferred them. So they're only used to having mom hold them when they fall asleep and so it's really upsetting to wake up by yourself and not see mom. So a lot of people think, oh, well, my child's doing this in the night, he's spoiled, he doesn't really understand that this is expected, so I'm just gonna let him be and he'll figure it out. We're gonna talk about that because that's not necessarily how we teach skills, um, but it is a really common belief. So the first scenario is just to wait. How long do you wait? What are we waiting for? <laughs> so I think it's good. You have to understand though that some children who are spirited when you wait, or just high energy, whatever that looks like, um, they're gonna wake themselves up all the way. If you wait for a child who's really intense, um, he could get really, really upset really fast, and that makes it harder to get back to sleep. Um, if you're not worried about a partner waking up or other children, then you can try and help an intense child understand that they need to wait a little bit. I usually say wait for two or three minutes with crying, um, as long as it's not intense. If it's intense, you usually go quickly. One of the reasons we do this is just so that we don't get in a habit of rescuing baby right away. Give the ones with the easygoing personalities that are more laid back or more secure even, a chance to go back to sleep on their own. But honestly, this is something that I see when a child knows how to put themselves to sleep. Then they start putting themselves back to sleep if they have the skills and if they're feeling secure. So if that's not happening for you, it's probably because you haven't taught your child to do it yet, or you have a child who doesn't have that easygoing, laid back personality, which is really, really common, especially in my group. So the next scenario was, um, I'm gonna wait, because my child might get tired of crying and then just give up and go to sleep, okay? I think that that could happen sometimes when a child is just really cranky and really demanding. A lot of times that would be maybe an older child who's got the fear of missing out, and just always cries when they go to sleep. There's a type of crying to sleep that's fine and that would be when it starts out loud and it gets softer and softer, like they're just letting off steam, okay? That type of crying to sleep is fine if your child does that. It's just the way your child goes to sleep and it really could be something to do with FOMO. So um, the most important thing is for you to recognize that there's this instinct in you that says 
the baby's crying respond. And that is so important because your child does not know how to take care of him or herself. The babies do not know how to regulate their emotions, so they need you. They need you to be there to calm them. It's a beautiful relationship and they depend on you. And so all that pressure that's out there that says, do not go to your baby during the night, let your baby cry, blah, blah, blah. They're forgetting how important that instinct is instinct is the intuition that you have inside and what the baby actually needs by the way in my email i talked about how there isn't a wrong way to handle these things in the night there isn't you guys you're doing the best you can and this is exhausting and i'm actually really really wanting to give you credit for what you do some of you have such a hard night situation and day and it is so exhausting and you know what we're not we're not already equipped with all the knowledge or the skills when we have a baby to know how to build all this stuff and there's so much conflicting information out there you guys are doing awesome and i don't want to ever think that what you're doing is wrong okay or how you're doing it is wrong um i'm just going to try and teach you a little bit so that we can work on some of these habits and also just give you some understanding so anyways let's move on past that one i think it's really important to respond to your child and not just let them cry until they give up okay we also want to teach them the things that they need to be able to do better and sleep longer. So the next one was go ahead and check on your child, check the diaper, soothe your child, pick up your child and put him back to sleep. Who doesn't do that? That's totally normal and typical. We need to make sure that we check on baby after a certain period because we're all moms. We understand the diaper could be really wet. The diaper could be poopy. Baby could be sick, there could be a fever, baby could be in pain. Um, obviously there's times when your child needs comfort, right? Sometimes they're going through growth spurts and they eat more often and um, yeah, I think that's about it. So we wanna make sure that we do check on them at a certain period. So my other, I talked about the two or three minute wait when they're crying, depending on the child. The other one is if your child is crying for, to, I don't know, kind of weak, then they remember to cry or they're playing then they cry that's what i call intermittent crying and that's usually five or ten minutes that we wait if there's playing it can be 10 or 15. so it depends during the leap your child's going to be kind of wired and wide awake and want to play sometimes if your child's safe and you can sleep while your kid's playing go for it like if they're okay and they're content and they're just playing and it's the middle of the night and your child's safe sleep it's okay <laughs> I just want you to know that all of this stuff is okay. It really is. Um, and there's always so much more for me to know, guys. When you when you ask a question in my successful sleep group and you want an answer, I often will just pick one pretty common answer for that topic and let everyone else give you ideas because there's so much for me to learn about your child to be able to really help all the way. And that's what I do with my clients. So in the group, I'm just really trying to point you in the right direction, give you some help and some direction and also help you, I said direction twice, also help you understand how important personality is and that some people just get lucky and then personality just, I mean, it can really, really affect sleep and it can really affect your life. So don't be hard on yourself and think, oh, I messed up. I'm not a good mom. Oh, it's my fault. People blame themselves all the time, but really it's just a child who might be more needy or sensitive or lots of energy or demanding or unpredictable when it comes to regularity. Um, children that are really intense or super hard and the ones who I'm trying to think I don't know I think I covered a lot of them but there's like 12 traits for spirited babies high needs babies that are really really challenging and it's not it's not you okay even when there's like a really hard situation the first few months like trauma or baby's been in the hospital the NICU and you hold your baby to sleep all the time and they're little usually around two or three months you can teach them not to unless that's the other one they're really physically attached um some babies actually have to have mom regulate emotions for a really long time and their situation is worse than a typical baby when it comes to that like some babies just need your attention and your soothing and your kindness they can stay in bed and you can just touch them but some babies have to be held to be able to calm down okay so there's so many elements here guys so the next one, to so definitely do those things that we just talked about with your baby. Um, I actually really like to try and help babies not need their diapers change when they're not eating in the night. So if your child isn't eating in the night, don't worry about that. Um, unless diapers are getting soaked, then you wanna get like a premium diaper. 
So the next scenario is pick your child up, sit, feed, or rock, or both. Totally fine, guys, especially in a leap or teething or whatever. Go in and just get your child up and get right to it. Go for it. If you know you're going to feed your child, I totally understand this as well. I'm going to talk in a minute about something else you can do instead to try and promote your child um, not being picked up and trying to put themselves back to sleep, okay? Next one is pick up, lay on chest, pat to sleep, or lay down, put your baby in bed, and go to sleep and feed. You know what? There's nothing wrong with those either. The one where people hold their baby on their chest and pat them makes me nervous because even though we can really teach ourselves to sleep light, um, every now and then you're going to just be exhausted. And so I just worry about safety with that. Um, but I understand. I know how it is. And I actually think that over time you do learn to sleep light. Um, but when a, when you have a newborn, you're not quite there with that. And that's when people do that the most. And so it just makes me really nervous. But um, go ahead and um, there's, there's ways to look online and find out how to co-sleep safely. So if that's where you're at right now because your child is hardly sleeping, you're just too tired and that's what you need to do, just make sure you're doing it safely. Laying on your side to feed and trying to create like a safe space, making sure there's no pillows or blankets around. Uh, you want to make sure no one else is in the bed who's had drugs or sedatives, um, alcohol, that sort of thing, so that your baby's safe. Um, and, you know, that's a that's a scenario that has to be the best fit for you. And so I'm never one to be like, ooh, co-sleeping is bad, because this is actually kind of a controversial topic. There's a lot of major breastfeeding supporters who say this is a natural thing. It's been going on for thousands of years. They do it in every other country. Um, but then the really, really concerned SIDS risk promoters are the ones saying don't ever co-sleep because they see a lot. They see a lot. But there's a lot of background in the SIDS incidents that we don't ever really get to learn about. And so it's just important for you to do what's right for you. And the other thing is, is some people can't co-sleep. They're so nervous all night. Baby is so restless. Baby is constantly latching and unlatching, kicking, moving, and that's not a good fit. If you and your child are sleeping like that, it's not a good fit. So definitely try and make some changes in that situation, okay? So that's really, those two things are not wrong and there's things that you do for survival. It's just that you want to have like a better plan for the future. So we want to teach your child to feel comfortable in their own bed and sleep in their bed and wake up in the night and put themselves back to sleep so that they can sleep all night. We want to teach them how to take good naps. And so we really just want to get things in place. So when you have to revert back to that or if you started out doing um, the chest thing or the co-sleeping and it's not a good fit for you or part of your plans, then um, just understand that got some projects there's some work to do and there's hope there are children out there who definitely are super super physically attached and they're the tough ones they're the toughest to change to get them to sleep on their own I really haven't run into any problems with young babies or toddlers um, with getting them out of mom and bed mom and dad's bed I think it's a lot harder when they're closer to one or older um, sometimes it can take months a lot more work we've got a lot of ups and downs with teething and sickness that come in the way and so those are some of the tougher situations, but I feel like there's always hope. And there's very rare cases when a child cannot move out of mom and dad's bed. A lot of it has to do with the parent too. How determined you are, how, how um, committed, if you're willing to do whatever it takes, and I don't mean just leaving your child to cry, but people get worn out and they lose their wind. So it's a case by case thing. So the next one is pacifier. So absolutely use the pacifier. If you want to, go for it. I think it's a godsend. I think it's a blessing. Somewhere around three months old, a lot of babies will just start spinning it out and not wanting it as much. Take advantage of that. Don't force it. Just because Sid says, Sid's um, avoidance, whatever, prevention, says use the pacifier. This is helpful, blah, blah, blah. I think it's actually the most helpful in the first few months from what I've researched. It just has a lot to do with the sucking. It helps them um, breathe better. It's just, actually, I think that they haven't quite understood why, but it is, has been proven to help avoid SIDS. So it's good. It's just that somewhere around three, four, five months is like your perfect window for taking it away and not having that problem. Cause either a baby is going to continually spit out the pacifier and need you to put it back in at that same age, 
or they're gonna spit it out and sleep really well the rest of the night. Those are really the two things that I see. And around six to eight months old, you can put a bunch of pacifiers in the bed for your child to learn to put it back in, to find one and put it back in. And that's what a lot of parents do because they just, I don't know, it's exhausting to think of weaning your child off a pacifier. So for the parents who have little ones, take advantage now. Just don't offer it as much while they're little. Um, only offer it as needed. And if you can teach your child to put themselves to sleep, you can try to do it without the pacifier and that's how you can wean. So that's what I usually do. All right, so the next one, the last scenario is try everything, worry about everything, worry that you're creating bad habits and that you're spoiling your child. Okay, that's what we all do, right? This is just what we do, it's okay. Um, but I just want you to know that you may not have tried everything. I am really creative in my approaches and I actually, some of the people might be like looking down on me for this, but I actually didn't take training. I didn't go to any kind of program to learn what I do. I've done my own research and I've done my own experience. I've had my own experience with children for 15 years before I um, started my business. So now I've got 17 and a half years of experience with children and sleep. And so, um, I really don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Uh, I can find all the research I want and apply it and try things and learn and I learn and learn and learn and learn all the time. So there's always hope. You haven't tried everything. There's a lot of methods out there that you haven't read about, you haven't heard about. Um, there's other people besides me that have their own creative approaches, but you, you, you know me and what I do works and I have a system and it works really well. So. I would love, love, love to talk to any of you on a free call about my services and help you. Um, you can even just do a consultation so we can give you more methods, worksheets, my written documents on how to do things. I also have a gentle methods workshop that you can buy on my website, which is definitely the most economical choice. And it's two hours of instruction about different methods and how to use them. And I share one of my own innovative methods for children who do not like their crib and they do not want to sleep in there. So it's really awesome. So um, anyways, you don't have to worry about bad habits and spoiling your child. Just respond with your instincts and you will get it right. Don't squash those and ignore them. They're actually important. So this brings me to what to do in a leap. And I kind of already talked about it, but if your child is really, really needy in a leap, respond, do what you need to do and focus on teaching your baby in the next period in between leaps the next period in between teething. If it's just gonna go on for months with leaps and teething, it might be better to wait. If you work with me, I can give you some direction to help you know what you can do during that time. But um, if your child has been sleeping really well and just starts sleeping really bad during a leap, it's very possible your child will go back to the good habits that they had before if they have skills. So that's the thing people don't always hear. Your child slept well before the leap ends, my kid's gonna sleep well. No, that's not necessarily true. Your child needs to know how to put himself to sleep. Your child needs to feel secure. You have to be getting the cues at the right time and helping your child um, take naps all day and not be awake too long. It's super, super important. Sleep begets sleep and people just don't realize that. They're always in a hurry to have their child awake longer and nap less and it's actually not what they need. So I'm all about helping kids sleep as much as possible because there is nothing better for their health except for nutrition. <laughs> so here is the biggest thing, okay? The protocol. All these things that we just talked about, I actually use. So what I teach my clients is make a plan, write it, put it on the wall, respond the same way every time. Make sure that you, um, if your child is gonna wake up to eat and, and it's okay, it's been long enough and you want to feed your child or they need it or it's a growth spurt, then you go through all the things in your on your plan quickly and then get to the feeding so that we're not awake too long and helping your child take longer to be back to sleep. So um, on other times when your child isn't in a leap or teething or super, super cranky, not needing to eat, then you go through these and you kind of stretch them out a little bit longer. So the plan that I usually follow, and this can differ for different people, would be first wait. I talked about fast for two to three minutes or five to 10 or 10 to 15. Second, go in and soothe your child laying down, even if that's for 30 seconds. You can also insert in this having dad do it. Dad can go in first, or sorry, a partner or spouse. And then um, you take over if it's not working. You can try to soothe baby in bed for a short amount of time or toddler or child. 
and then go ahead and wait again if you want a um, little bit of space go across the room whatever go out of the room then you can go back and pick up your child and soothe your child lay them back down when they're calm wait again if you want soothe again if you want um, I usually just have a few things and then go ahead and pick up your child and feed or rock or rock first and then feed whatever you need to do walk around the room and bounce so just have a plan in place of things that you do before you get to the feed to sleep or the rock to sleep okay because those are just going to be like it's like putting up a wall between baby needing you and baby doing it on their own okay babies doing it on their own uh, each of those steps is a deterrent. So it could be just three or four minutes right now, two minutes if your child's going to eat. Um, it could be 10 or 15 or 20 if you're really trying to help your child learn to, to go back to sleep on their own. After you've night weaned any feedings that are habits, um, and I do that gradually and slowly, and you can find out more about that in another video or in another um, post on my successful sleep group that's when you're going to actually have to work harder to get your child to go back to sleep without eating. So having a protocol like this is important. So, all right. Of course, I always wait to the end when you guys are done and you're out of time to talk about my services. I already kind of talked about them. I just want you to know that you can set up a free call. Go to sweetslumbertime.com. Click on free call. It's a tab at the top and there's buttons everywhere. You can find out a lot of information about me, my services, there's testimonials, there's videos. The homepage has a whole bunch of videos. There's blogs. So just go visit. Stay a while. Make yourself comfortable and at home and um, set up a free call. Let's chat. Let me see how I can help you so that you don't have to do this on your own. So you can sleep all night. So you can have a great napper. So you can have a child with permanent sleep habits so that you can focus at work and you can feel great about yourself and the work that you're accomplishing and not be so distracted and all of these things lead to more success, more happiness, more wholeness, more health. It's it's just priceless stuff, right? Priceless benefits and results in your life. So be good to yourself. Take care of yourself. This is good for you. It's good for a child. So have a great weekend, guys. Thank you so much.